So, I popped into High House Insurance to see if they could quote for my house insurance rather than using the internet. High House got a great deal. So, to celebrate, I bought a posh hairdo. It made me look beautiful, gorgeous enough to become a highly paid model. I then won Celebrity Big Brother. I had an affair with an MP. Now, I'm promoting a doll of me that says, Cool, blimey, you're well fit. <laughs> Happy things happen when you talk face to face with High House Insurance. See if we can beat your home insurance quote from the internet. Find us on the High Street Selsey or call 606 552. Hello and a warm welcome to Manhood Internet Radio. I'm Tony Wiener, your host for this show. So what do we have for you? Well, we will start the programme as usual with Alison's review of what's on in the area and that will be followed with some exciting news from Tracy of Local Life magazine. Theresa White talks to Keith about the Ladies Thursday group and we have an interview with Alan Pryor about his architecture technology business. Last but not least, we talk to local solicitor Mark Riley about the services his office offers. OK, so we have a lot for you again. So let's start the show. It's over to Alison for a roundup of what's on in the area. Hello and welcome once again to our weekly rundown of what's happening in Selsey and across the Manhood Peninsula. So we're headed already into September and uh, just before the children go back to school there are a few more things going on. On Thursday the 1st of September it's the Sea Island WI monthly meeting that's at 7.30 in the evening at the Selsey Centre. This month it's going to be a flower demonstration by Dorothy Barber. Also on the 1st of September we're gearing up for Christmas in Selsey already. There's a community Christmas lunch meeting. So getting ready for that, 6.30 in the evening at the fire station. So please come along if you're interested in helping to keep that wonderful event going. On Friday, that's the 2nd of September, the National Blood Service will be here at the Selsey Centre from 2 o'clock until 4.30 in the afternoon. With a break, then they'll have another evening session from 5.30 until 7.45. That's Friday, the 2nd of September. On Saturday, odds and bobs in aid of the Selsa Cancer Relief Fund. That's happening at 10 o'clock in the morning at the Methodist Church Hall. Now, looking ahead, Checker Trade have a charitable foundation and they're trying to raise funds to support the Lighthouse Foundation in Nepal, which is helping the ongoing effort to repair and rebuild following the devastating earthquake in Nepal last year. So, in order to help them, how about abseiling down Portsmouth's Spinnaker Tower? If you want to take part, there's a cost of £50 to actually abseil and you must make a commitment to raising at least £200 in sponsorship prior to the big day. So if you'd like to find out more about that, you do need to contact Checker Trade. Uh, the number is a mobile number 07740 366429. Let me give you that again. 07403 double six four two nine and that's the phone number of Claire Allen. You can also contact her by email Claire dot Allen. She spells Claire C L A I R E dot Allen A double -L, L E N at checkertrade dot com. You must be over eighteen to take part and if you're in any if they they're in any doubt about that you may be required to produce some proof of age. You must weigh less than 130 kilograms which is 20 stone or 286 pounds and that that's because it's the maximum weight that the harness can take. You will not be allowed to abseil if you can't meet any of those requirements and of course if you're pregnant but other than that if you'd like to have fun down the Spinnaker Tower abseiling then do contact Checker Trade. Now, with all those different things going on, let's have a look at the weather forecast for the week beginning the 31st of August. On Wednesday, we're forecasted to have 22 degrees Celsius or 72 Fahrenheit in Old Money with an 8 mile an hour wind southwesterly. On Thursday, the temperature is dropping very slightly down to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 Celsius, with a wind speed of 7 miles an hour from the south. 
on Friday, back up again, 73 degrees F or 23 degrees Celsius and 9 mile an hour southerly wind on Friday. Saturday, steady temperature, 73 and 23, 9 mile an hour wind, a south southwesterly. And then on Sunday, dropping very slightly down to 21 degrees Celsius, 70 Fahrenheit. But the wind is picking up 10 miles an hour and that will be a south southeasterly. And for those people who want to get out on the beach, let me tell you about the tides next week. Beginning on Wednesday, high tide on Wednesday will be 11.50 in the morning, that's 10 to 12, and low tide in the afternoon at 10 past 5. They, of course, draw out during the week, ending the following Tuesday with a low tide at 8.30 in the morning and a high tide at 3 in the afternoon. Those tide times, of course, and the weather temperatures also apply to the witterings. So now I want to move across there and find out what's happening next week at the witterings and Bracklesham. On Wednesday the 31st of August, it's time for table tennis, which is a drop-in and play session for adults to be held at the barn from 10 until 12. Alongside that, the CBT motorcycle training at the barn from 9 until 11. And we've also got gyrokensis with Jen from 11 until 12. After lunch, you can have a go at belly dancing with Step Inside at Bracklesham Barn from 1 until 2, followed immediately by short mat bowls from 2 until 4. In the evening at the barn, it's time for Zumba with Louise. That's from 6.30 until 7.30. And it will be happy hour at Pond Barn from 5 until 8.00. Moving on then into September, Busy Bugs Toddler's Gym will meet on Thursday at the barn from 9.15 until 12.15. The Stitch and Yarn at the Witterings Medical Centre from 10.30 until 12.30. And Knit and Natter at East Wittering Library from 11 till 12.30. At West Wittering Memorial Hall, it's time for the Witterings Master Art Group. They meet from 10 until 12. And there's also West Wittering Short Mat Bowls. Three sessions there, 10 till 12, 2 till 4 and 7 until 9.30 in the evening. If you're interested in that, you need to speak to Maggie, 673231. That's Maggie for the short map bowls, 673231. That's held at West Wittering Memorial Hall. Also on Thursdays, the Thursday group at Bracklesham Barn meet from 2 until 4. And there's an auction at Pond Barn. The viewing is from 5.30 in the evening. Later that night, it's time for the monthly cinema night. And this month, it's going to be Eddie the Eagle, who some of you may remember with his uh, amazing feats of uh, height. So that's at Bracklesham Barn at 7.30 in the evening. On Friday, it's time for Coastliners Line Dancing at the Village Hall from 2 until 4.30 on a Friday. Then on Sunday, uh, Windrush Church have their meeting at Bracklesham Barn. They meet from 10.30 in the morning until 12.45. And in the evening at Pond Barn, it's the quiz night beginning at 8. There's also Modern Jive Dancing on Sunday from 7.30 until 9 at the Village Hall. Then Monday, we've got Little Duckling's Mother and Toddler Group at Bracklesham Barn. They toddle from 9.30 until 11.30. It's also short mat bowls at the barn, 10.30 until 1. In the evening, it's time for yoga with Elaine at Bracklesham Barn from 7 until 8.30. And also in the evening, there's ARO Ladies Beginner Kickboxing with Verity at Bracklesham Barn from 7.30 until 8.30. Also on Mondays, it's time for Weight Watchers at 5.30. That's at the Village Hall. Then the next day, Tuesday the 6th, we've got Little Explorers Play and Learn Together. They meet at Bracklesham Barn from 9.30 until 11. There's Meet and Greet at West Wittering Memorial Hall with coffee, games, homemade soup and a roll. They meet at 10.15 until 1 o'clock. Also in the morning, we've got Yoga with Elaine at Bracklesham Barn. She's doing that from 10 until 11. And it's the Witterings, Quilters, St Peter's Roman Catholic Church Hall from 7 until 9 o'clock in the evening. If you're interested in joining the Quilters, you do need to speak to Judith, Judith Rogers, 
Her number is 511-431. That's Judith Rogers, 511-431. It's also time on Tuesday for the Community Pop Choir. They meet at West Wittering Memorial Hall from 7 until 9. And the Badminton Club meet at Brackersham Barn from 7.30 until 9.30. So I think that's about it for the first week in September, just before the children go back to school. So hope you enjoy that week and find plenty to do. I'll speak to you again next week. Bye for now. Thank you, Alison. It is still a busy time in the region. Now it's over to Keith, who is talking to Tracy of Local Life magazine about exciting developments with the business. Right, I'd uh, like to introduce now a young lady that everybody just about refers to as Tracy from Local Life. <laughs> Um, she's known by most people on the peninsula, I think, by that. And uh, she's going to be telling us some good news about stuff that's going on with local life. And, of course, that's our favourite magazine. Morning, Tracy. Hi, Keith. Now, what's happening down well, in your world? lots of exciting things happening. September is going to be a very exciting month for us. First of all, we are launching our Bogner Area magazine. So that starts to be delivered for the first time in September. That increases our coverage to 44,500 copies of the magazine every month. Of course, each area is different and specific to the area. Um, so that's very exciting. So if there's anyone on the peninsula that likes to have work in Bognor, Aldwick, Pagham, Nightimber, Burstead, get in touch because we cover all of that area. And then on the 1st of September, we are taking over ownership of BizCards UK, which is a printing company based on the parade here in East Wittering. So we'll be le le oh, excuse me, moving the local life office down to the parade. So we'll have a presence in the village, which will be very exciting and some more room. And we'll also be offering every kind of print service that you can think of under the sun. So business cards, letterheads, order of services, flyers, um, large format printing, roller banners, anything that you need printing, just pop in and see us and we'll be able to offer you a really good price and a very friendly deal. So everybody already knows who we are, so it's just a nice little extension to the services that we can offer. And we'd like to... Um, We'd like you all to come in and see us. We will have an open grand opening, but we've got a little bit of work to do in there first. So as soon as the grand opening's date is announced, we'll let you know. And please do all come down and say hello. Well, that's great news. I mean, hey, today, the man of Peninsula, tomorrow the world. <laughs> you <laughs> never know. You <laughs> know how it's going. Well, uh, we, of course, wish you every success. Thank you Tracy, very uh, much. As I'm sure you know. And... Uh, we hope the new business does well. If it does anywhere near, near as well as uh, local life has done over the past two or three years, I'm sure it will be uh, one of the busiest businesses in the area. That's lovely. Thank you so much. <coughs> Absolute pleasure. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Now over to Keith, who is talking to an amazing local lady. With me now, I've got uh, Theresa White. And Theresa's going to be with us over the next few weeks, actually, uh, talking about different subjects. And uh, she can talk about many subjects with great knowledge. So uh, you might want to listen up. But coming over the next few, few weeks, uh, Theresa's going to be talking about the Ladies Thursday group that she's involved with, fibromyalgia. And uh, that's definitely worth a listen. And she's also going to be talking about her passion, which is dogs. So uh, this week, I believe it's Ladies Thursday group, it Teresa. Is. Yes, so, it is. Yes, uh, Tell us about the Ladies Thursday group. Right. Ladies Thursday group was founded um, about 50, 60 years ago. Um, we used to have, we had a census when I first took over as chair, which was about six years ago now. Um, to see who had actually started it and where it started. And we had about a dozen different versions from different ladies that had been going forever to the group. Um, and in actual fact, it caused quite a war. <laughs> so, so we stopped in the end and we decided we'd just let them imagine what they wanted to imagine. Um, lovely group. It was over 100 strong. There was a waiting list. But times change. Um, Ladies now don't need groups like that as much until they get quite elderly. The younger ladies, it started as the Young Wives Club, 
and it's now more the young grandmothers club um, and young wives nowadays don't join clubs they it's very rare to find the youngsters who want to come along to a club because years ago you couldn't go in a pub on your own as a woman you couldn't go out and about on your own in the evening um, and so all they had really was bingo which was quite acceptable what to go a sad to. Life. I know, I know <laughs> it is. So therefore, the need for a club like ours has diminished greatly. But in saying that, what we've taken on is a lot of the elderly. Now, there's a lot of elderly down in the Witterings, which is where it's based. But um, also, of course, with that, the numbers fluctuate because they they get ill, they lose a spouse, they don't want to come out for a while they move away they might go and live with children or whatever so the numbers go up and down a lot and now we're lucky if we get between 20 and 30. does it does, does the season make any difference i mean like yes. I'm, I'm, what i'm thinking about is in the winter it's dark it's drab it's smooth, and people think oh i can't be bothered i can't yeah. get out of my chair and go yeah. or, or or does it actually work the opposite in, in this case where people say well you know i don't get out much during the winter so I'll go to the Thursday club. Yeah, yeah. I suppose really that depends on if they have transport. If they're still driving or if they can get on the manhood bus and, and get transport or get a lift, uh, which is why we sort of changed things around. We, changed, we used to have evening uh, meetings from 7 till 9 or 10, however long it went on. But we stopped all that and we had daytime meetings and then we decided we'd change venue because we wanted to capture more of the people in a certain area who didn't have cars and transport, mm -hmm. could only yeah. walk there. Yeah. So we changed from the middle of East Wittering Village, in the Village Hall, we went down to Bracklesham Barn, which is in Bracklesham, obviously, yeah. and um, we there's a new um, estate down there and it's got a lot of elderly ladies on it or ladies on their own mm. of a of a certain age you know and um so we captured that group of people and the ones who were coming from the Witterings either had a lift because they all knew each other by then yeah, or yeah. they uh, managed to get on the manhood bus so it's worked quite well we're up to about 30 now we've stopped having speakers for the simple reason that speakers want about 50 pounds now to come out if that you're lucky if you get one for mm, that yeah. unless it's a charity and then they're usually selling stuff and the ladies get to the point where they think i don't want to keep spending my money on things like that or they don't agree with that particular charity or they yeah. already donate yeah. you know yeah. you get yeah. into that catchment so um we decided to go for tea and chat uh, sometimes there's nice cream cakes and things that we buy if there's money in the kitty and we have games we put lots and lots of games out so if they just want to sit there and chat they can but if they want to bring a game along or if they want to use some of ours they can get around a table and um, we've found some lovely games um something about bananas bananas galore or something that that was a fun Never game heard that, of no it. me Gunges neither up all manners of the manner of pictures <laughs> but it was a really fun <coughs> game and we had a good afternoon that afternoon i'm not chair anymore um if anyone needs any details there's a lovely lady running it called Helen um, and I will give her contact number out at the end. She arranges lots of trips out in between the one meeting that we have a month now. We, so we meet on the first Thursday of every month between two and four at the Bracklesham Barn, which is down Garden Avenue in Bracklesham. Everyone around there knows it, so you could just ask. Um, there's plenty of car parking and it's wheelchair friendly lovely room that we meet in it's a little small and if we get any bigger we will have to move to the big hall rather than have the little room um lots of tea you can have you know as many cups of tea as you want biscuits cakes whatever and there's trips to the canal we have a regular slot where we go to the pond barn and have a meal we have the oap meal which is quite reasonable down there i think it's a carvery so you can just go up and have you know what you want um and we she also arranges um a trip to one of the garden centers and again there's always someone can give you a lift so as long as you can get to a central point we can pick you up or some some of the ladies can pick you up there's not a problem that way around oh good so it sounds like it's uh it's starting to pick up again yeah 
Hope so. And uh, a takeoff. Fingers crossed. Yes, and, and it, 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 these sort of community-driven projects like that, always there's always somebody that's looking for that. Yeah. But perhaps don't know where to find it. Yeah. And, and, and that seems to be the problem. You quite often see on Facebook locally people saying, oh, could anybody tell me where I could find this sort of attraction or this yeah. you know um so you know, it hopefully it'll it'll pick up again and and all those young wives that used to be attending <laughs> will uh turn out in their hundreds uh, and you'll oh, have to so. hire somewhere bigger than Brackwish and barn then <laughs> but there you go well thanks for coming in and filling us in on that uh i'll give you the contact and you've got the contact details, details yeah. yeah it's helen on 01243 six seven two one seven four yeah that's it that's brilliant well thanks very much Teresa, for Thank that you. and we'll talk to you again soon okay wow who knew the thursday group had been running for so long amazing now let's go back to keith who is talking about architecture technology with alan Pryor. well i'd like to welcome the studio now a gentleman called alan Pryor, and alan is from ap architectural and uh well, I'll let him tell you a bit about himself. Good morning, Alan. Good morning, Keith. Now, an architect, an architectural technologist, which is it, sir? Okay, well, well my name is Alan Pryor, and I'm a chartered architectural technologist. Uh, my company is AP Architectural. Uh, I live in Breckwich and Bay, and I'm based here, I work locally, but my work can take me anywhere from Southampton to London. So an architect architectural uh, technology is the application of science and building technology to architecture and construction. Uh, it's a varied and diverse occupation, recognised as having specialist skills enabling technologists to manage the design process. And I'm a member of the Chartered Institute of Architectural Technologists, uh, which is the lead professional body that represents the profession of architectural technology. Now... What's the difference between an architect and a chartered architectural technologist? I'm struggling with that one. <laughs> well, well, an architect, which is a protected title, uh, deals with the art of building, bringing together the aesthetic and practical elements of building. So a chartered architectural technologist focuses on the, the technical and functional elements of design. So we apply the twin pillars of design and technology to construction. So they're different disciplines, but overlap considerably. So chartered architectural technologists are qualified to both design and lead projects. Uh, incidentally, the title uh, chartered architectural technologist is protected by law. You have to pass a rigorous process to gain the right to use the title. Um, historically, technologists were the, the technicians that worked in architects' offices. Uh, but in the 1960s, they formed their own body so that their contribution to the design process was recognised. Uh, and in 2005, architectural technology was granted its royal charter and recognised as a profession in its in its own right. So, so to sort of clarify a bit, you're the guys that said that the architects were the guys that did the drawings and said that on the back of a cigarette packet or something and said we'd, we'd like to build this building like this, and you were the guys that said can't be done. I think, in, in a nutshell, I think that uh, architectural technologists and technicians are the guys that um, do the detailing and, and, and make the building work. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, somebody says comes up with a design, and and you say, well, we need to use this material for that, and we need to use absolutely you know, this, this this sort of structure, steel work construction initially to you know, to bear that weight. And, and stuff a like. Absolutely. I think. Um, Architects initially were uh, dealt with the design and the technologists and the technicians uh, basically drew it and put it together. But um, as the years have gone by, I think they've they recognised that we're actually offering a lot more than, than just that. So uh, now we can actually design, we can lead projects um, and we can do pretty much what architects do. But we just can't use a title architect. So we use a t title of architectural technologist. Oh, I see. OK. So, so what sort of background do you have? Well, I've got a trade background. Um, I worked for many years actually building, uh, from extensions, refurbishment, uh, building new houses. Uh, so I gained a, a great deal of experience uh, building, uh, being at the sharp end. Uh, so when I decided to change to a career in design rather than construction, uh, I was well placed with many years of building knowledge and experience. Uh, so I went to Solent University, studied for five years, gaining a first class degree in architectural technology. Uh, before being admitted as a chartered architectural technologist with the CIAT. 
Um, so architectural technology uh, suited me well uh, and comp complemented my experience. Um, I lean more to a nice design that is built well rather than a design that looks good but doesn't work in reality. So if I wanted to have a, you know, I mean, it, it's a grand title that might frighten people off an architectural technologist. People think, oh my God, I just wanted somebody to draw me up some plans and build a new house for me. So if I wanted to have an extension or a new house built, could I come to you for design drawings? Yeah, absolutely. So I use the latest um, computer software to produce both technical drawings and 3D drawings. So typically a client will have a, an idea of what they want to achieve. I would then carry out a survey of the property and produce some feasibility drawings, which would be discussed with the client. Um, we make changes uh, until we're both happy. Uh, it's a bit of a partnership, really. Um, some clients have little or no experience and, and need some help visualizing what their project would actually look like. Uh, the use of 3D images can certainly help with this. Uh, I can produce photo realistic rendered drawings to show how it will look in reality uh, rather than just in black and white. Of course, these take a bit more time to produce. Uh, not always necessary, but on most projects are well worth the extra effort. So invariably, projects are subject to planning permission being granted, uh, and generally this is the first hurdle to overcome. Typically, there are a number of constraints, and sometimes it can be fairly frustrating, but it's all part of the process. So once we've got planning permission sorted out, and I mean, we all, I think we all probably know how difficult that can be at, at times. Absolutely. Yeah. What other services do you offer? Well, generally, once the planning permission is granted, uh, the next step is to produce drawings and specifications for building regulation approval. Uh, this is how the building is going to be put together. Things like the foundations, the drains, the walls, etc. How much insulation is required, how the roof will be constructed. Uh, so plans, section details are produced to show how all the elements of the building are put together. So the building regulations can be fairly complex, as you would imagine. Uh, if you think of all the different parts of a building, each has to meet the building regulations if it applies. And in order to comply with building regulations, a set of approved documents, each covering different areas of the building, for example, the stability, the fire, thermal efficiency, sound, to name but a few, are used to demonstrate compliance. So typically this is done by producing 2D detailed drawings at various scales together with detailed notes or, or specifications. Yeah, we all know what a minefield, things like that are nowadays. Absolutely, there, yeah. There are regulations for regulations. Um, and of course, if you don't, especially thermal efficiency now, it, it seems to be a, a, a huge thing now, whereas it was... Yeah, it's a, it's a massive thing that's, that's in the news now and is the top of the list, really. Mm. Um, thermal yeah. efficiency, making our buildings more efficient and more cost efficient. Now, going through all this, I mean, are there, are there any other specialists that get involved in the process of designing and, and you know, reaching the end product as it were? Yeah, sure. The, the building process is a, is a multidiscipline process. For example, most of the time, beams, rafters, joists all need to be calculated to prove that they can carry the loads that they're going to be subject to. Uh, so we use structural engineers to carry out this type of work. And of course, we deal with both planning and building uh, control departments of the, of the local authority. Now, over the years, things have obviously changed dramatically. And some of the buildings we look at that were built 400 years ago, or even a lot longer, and they're still standing. And we think, well, will these buildings that we see being put up nowadays being standing in 400 years time? How long do you, if you design a building now, how long do you realistically expect it to be there? Well, um, I know it's a difficult question. No, well, the, 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 it's generally accepted that the, the design of a building is, is only for about 60 years, mm. surprisingly. So, um, you know, that's what it's designed to last is 60 years. But, um, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of buildings being built now that are going to last for just as long as the old ones, to be, yeah. to be fair. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I worked on buildings. My father was a builder and I worked with him when I left school and I worked on buildings then. That have been torn down since. Yeah. And when when you work when you're building something, you you expect it to be there forever. Yeah. And and then all of a sudden, what was a new building when you were younger and you worked on it, all of a sudden it's being ripped down to be replaced by something else because it's old. You know. It's yeah. I guess, I guess that's progress. Uh, I mean, a lot of um, a lot of buildings being designed nowadays are are being built for for the future, uh, so they can be used for different purposes. So once the the use of a building 
um, has, has gone by, uh, then it can be changed rather than being torn down. It can be changed uh, to put to another use. So that's a, that's a thing that's been uh, being brought about now. And what do you think about some of the, the buildings that have gone up in London over the past few years? The Shard springs to mind, um, the Gherkin. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, things are changing. The buildings are no longer just oblong or square shape. No. You know, they're... And I think the that's um, absolutely huge, huge, great chunks of the building now cantilevered. Yeah. And you think, you know, how does that stay up? Well, I think that's where the technology has developed over the years, and that's where architectural technology has certainly come into the into the forefront um, of being able to use computer aided design, three D um, designs. Uh, and, and the computer is so powerful nowadays that you can actually do things that you wouldn't have been able to do, um, you know, fifty years ago. Saying that, there's a lot of buildings that were um, drawn by hand that um you know would be would be almost would be quite difficult to to reproduce nowadays but mm. uh, so you know it can be done so what do you enjoy most about what you do well i think it's, certainly it's nice to stand back and, and admire a job that's well done um whether that's something that you've built yourself or something that you've designed and then someone else has built um and i think there's a great deal of satisfaction in overcoming a problem I think when someone wants to extend their home or refurbish a property um, or build a new house, it's to solve a problem. A um, bit more space, a property in need of being updated or someone needs a new home. So helping to achieve that can be satisfying. Certainly when I started in construction, I immersed myself in my trade. Uh, I really enjoyed the technical aspects of building, whether it was how arches were being built, the different ways walls can be built, and particularly how the decorative and intricate ways that buildings have been built over the years. Um, I think I tend to favour a more traditional design of building, but also find, as we talk about the Shard and the, and the Gherkin, the more contemporary buildings are quite striking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, I mean, they, they certainly are on the, on the skyline now. You can't miss them. Um, but what you can miss is some of the smaller buildings that were more intricately designed. Yeah, um, and I think London's quite a, quite a, um, a point where you get uh, the, the new and the old complementing each other. Yes, uh, in, yes, in a lot of yeah. cases, so it's not a matter of just um, because it was old buildings. And, and of course, you know, we go back to the old story, the old thing of, of labour costs. When some <clears> of these <throat> grand cathedrals were built, labour didn't cost anything at all. No. You know, it was so so cheap. Yeah. Um, and if and and I was um, in France recently, and we were looking at an old uh, cathedral there. And I think something like 42 people died mm. during the construction of it, and they didn't die of old age. No, no, no. You know, they, they, they died working on the site, and it was just accepted. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, but bearing in mind, of course, it took over 100 years to build it. Yeah, which we wouldn't wait for a building to be to take that long to do. So no, that's that's right. Yeah. I mean, so nowadays, you know. Well, we use more modern modern methods of construction. Mm. You know, quicker methods. I mean, that is what people uh, want: houses that are built cheaper. Yeah, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, that's a that's, that's a, a, an aim for today is to build uh, houses for young people to be able to build and to try and get that done cheaply is a uh, is a difficult well, uh, difficult you have problem to, to take overcome. out one of the main costs, and of course, the main cost is labour, or well, one of the main costs is labour. So you've got to reduce that. Yeah, the, the, the well, amount of labour hours put into absolutely to building a, a, any construction. Yeah, um, otherwise that will affect the price. Yeah, tremendously. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to see the look on some of your clients' face if you turned up and said, Ooh, yes, we can do that for you. It takes us about 80 years. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, yeah, that, that used to happen. And I suppose that's the difference between those buildings that were put up years ago. Um, there was there was no rush. Everything could be done intricately. Everything could be done to the nth degree um, yeah. because it, it just cost peanuts to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and certainly if you look at our, uh, Victorian buildings, uh, which were sort of more uh, ornate uh, than clearly what we're building today, then that was the case, that they had more time um, uh, to, to do that type of work. Mm. Uh, and nowadays, we, we, you know, you have to get a building up fairly quick uh, with, a, with, a, with a good standard, you know, and, and that's, the, that's the key point is to um, build buildings cheaper. But uh, to, to still keep to that standard. Yes, I mean, in this in this country, thankfully, we don't have to worry too much about that because the buildings are built to a, a good standard. Absolutely, and we can rest assured of that. Unfortunately, when we see programs about foreign countries where there's you know, a, a slight earth tremor and half the place falls down, you know, yeah, there there is that. We, if you've been there and visit them, you'd know why. Yeah, but thankfully, we we don't live in an earthquake zone, so no, you know no, we, we don't have to deal with that. But um, but yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, thanks for coming in, Alan. Okay, appreciate it. It's, it's uh, been a bit of an eye-opener. 
Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's always good to hear from everybody nowadays seems to knock, um, architects and architectural te technologists. Um, God, look at that monstrosity. Ruins a skyline. Yeah. I don't imagine anybody's said that about cathedrals all over the world. When they put up Westminster Cathedral, I don't suppose anybody said, what an eyesore. <laughs> well, I guess um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and it's very subjective, what one person likes, another person doesn't. And, um, you know, so we can't all like the same things for a start. And, um, but, yeah. Now, if somebody wants to contact you and they want uh, you to come around and design yeah. their house, the new home that they perhaps want to build from scratch, or if they want a bit of fancy um, extension put on the back with some new ideas, how can they contact you? Well, first of all, um, I've got an advert in the, in the local life. That's one thing okay. to say. Uh, if they want to reach me by phone, then my phone number is 672-589. Uh, the website is www.abarchitectural.com. Um, and email is a r prior uh, alan r prior at gmail dot com. There we go. Then. That's uh, everything we need, and uh, hopefully you'll have lots of people wanting new castles built and stuff like that. Great. Thanks once again okay. for coming. Thanks, Keith. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. A fascinating business. Now it's back to Keith, who is talking to Mark Riley about his local solicitor practice. Right with me now, I've got Mark Riley. And Mark is from MJR Solicitors, and that's Mark's own firm. And I would describe Mark as a non-stuffy solicitor. He's the kind of guy you can go to and feel quite comfortable. In my past experiences with solicitors, um, they come over sometimes as a bit dour. But um, I can assure you this uh, gentleman's not like that at all. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning. Now, I'd describe you as a non-stuffy solicitor. Um, is that something you would portray yourself or you see yourself as somebody that can be approached? Yeah, I mean, it's a kind of you for the nice introduction. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I try to be um, different and take that uh, slightly different approach and more personal approach to it um, rather than being just your, your typical firm, as it were, um, trying to be a bit more individualised and a bit more personable um, and hopefully offer something different that other places don't. No, you say offer something different that other places don't, in, in what way? Um, it's more, what I hope to be different with is, is my service levels. Um, I obviously offer the same as other people, the wills, your probate, estate administration, um, powers of attorney. Um, yes, that is very, um, very much the same as what others will offer. Um, but hopefully it's my service that is slightly different. The more personal touch, the more face-to-face -face I try and be with my clients um, and the more going out to see people, spending time with people and, and just spending that little bit extra um, that wasn't possible when I was with um, previous firms or, or larger firms where um, your time was, was measured down to the last few minutes. So, um, so now it's... And charged of, accordingly. It charged accordingly. <laughs> so now it's a bit more flexible um, and obviously I'm trying to offer a lot of fixed fees so people know what it is from the start. So I can sit there with them and uh, they're not concerned about how much time they're taking with me. And they're more happy to sit and chat and talk and, and go through everything they want to go through um, without sort of being scared of what might, the bill might be at the end. Well, it, it does weigh heavily on people's minds, you know, with, with solicitors, but any legal people. Um, when people come and speak to you about you know, something they've got, probate or, or what have you, um, they don't understand, perhaps, that it could be paid for out of, the, out of an estate. So if somebody's died and there's yeah. some money, that it can be paid for. And they think the minute they speak to a solicitor, they're going to get a bill. Yeah. So it, well, it has to be paid straight away. So, you know, I do understand that, that people are sometimes a little bit frightened. And then, of course, that means that they're trying to keep what they tell you down to a minimum. Yep. Which makes it more difficult because... Yeah. I mean, it's nice to be able to sit with people then for them to feel they can open up to me, um, which is why... It, Everything I do is there's an initial free consultation to mm. discuss the options. So there's no there's no charge for me to sit and talk to someone and tell them what options they do have. Once they then decide what option they would like to follow, which they would like to pursue, I can then tell them it's going to be X amount. Um, that way they know exactly what they're having, why they're having it. And it, it, it's nice from a, a client's perspective as well. Um, they quite like to be able to get a little bit of advice, and a little bit of guidance because Occasionally, people do ask for something that they don't actually need um, or they don't actually require. And you can tell them that in, in plain English at, at no cost, which is 
sometimes it's, it's quite nice to be helpful in that way as well. Well, of course, when, when anything happens as far as legal advice is concerned, there always seems to be a wealth of barrack room lawyers, friends, you know, accomplices, if you like, that want to tell you, either, well, they can't do that legally, or they, you know, or you should do this legally, and of course, nine times out of ten, it's wrong. Yeah. It might have been correct ten years ago, but law changes you know, quite quickly, and, and especially with things like probate and, and, and you know, amounts, figures change quite, quite uh, regularly. The government changes the, the amount of tax you have to pay or whatever. And, and when somebody did it five years ago, and the information they're giving you is five years old, and of course, you know, if they come and see you, they get updated. Won't they? Yeah, I mean, like I say, it's it's just nice to have a conversation with people sometimes, be able to take my time, um, have a good chat through. Um, and the law does change quite frequently. We, we all know a solicitor, we all have a family, friend or a relative that is a solicitor um, or has some legal training or some legal expertise. Um, it's important to or sort just of, reads books. Or just reads books. <laughs> but obviously it's always good to listen to people. It's always good to get different uh, opinions because um, you know, no two people are going to have the same opinion on uh, how certain things should be carried out or how things should be certainly followed. Um, so it's good to sort of you know get that variance, but it's also good to to realise who are you speak to? Is that person specifically qualified in that? Do they have particular expertise um, in that? Is that what they do? Uh, and just get a varied opinion from from people. So um, I think people always want to try and help. So that's probably where family and friends. Oh yeah, absolutely. They, they're doing it with good intention. Yeah. But, but that, you know, that their information may just be three or four years out of date, but it could make a big difference. And, and, you know, yeah, I mean, something... well, I know it's definitely that amount, you know. Uh, uh, and of course, a lot of, of, of um, law, it wills, things like that, are down to interpretation. You know, and, yeah, you, know yeah. you can read them, if you like, quite often to suit yourself. Yeah, and, I mean, and, hopefully and that's... you find sort of, out that, yeah. you know, it's not quite as you read it, your hopes of a grand fortune coming into you might be dashed. Yeah, I mean, hopefully that's sort of where a professional sort of comes in who has expertise in that area. Um, it's sort of when it's initially drafted, hopefully, you know, you have spoke to the, the right professional who's given you the right advice and it should be sort of crystal clear. Mm. Um, so then when you come to deal with it, it does make it easier, which is why, you know, I'm quite keen on sort of recommending to people, okay, it's not the most fun thing in the world to get your wills and uh, uh, estates sorted or, or uh, in a legally put out into paper, um, but it's, it's always important to have. It's a strange thing, wills, aren't it? It is. People it's think, no one wants to the minute they've made a will, they're going to die. Yeah. You know, I'm sure, because I know I did. And I, you know, and I never made a will until, oh, six or seven years ago, I suppose now, maybe a little bit longer. Um, because of that, you know, I thought, oh, but what do I want a will for? I'm only 60, I don't need a will at 60, I ain't going to die yet. Well, yeah. so you never know. Yeah, I mean, and so if only people understood how difficult it is for those left behind, if you haven't made a will, it, it really is so, so difficult. It can be made very complicated and obviously it's, it's, it's important to get that advice to make sure your estate goes to where you want. I think people don't really think about it too much. Essentially, it could be the most important document you ever deal with because if you pass away, essentially people's houses hundreds of thousands of pounds are, are going ways that they may not have wanted to go mm. so essentially it really is a really really important document that deals with probably more money than you ever have done in a lifetime but you've probably poured over other contracts and even the receipts to uh, down to the final few pounds when sort of the most important document right. you haven't really spent the time on and you get the bill from your for your internet connection you check it down to the penny i um, always do i yeah. make sure you yeah, know when it's <coughs> when it's uh hundreds of thousands possibly from, you know, benefit from a will or, or the money that you want to dispose of went under your death to members of your family or, you know, your wife that you've got that nobody knows about or, or whatever. <laughs> if you don't sort it out, then, you know, that money can disappear. It certainly can, yeah. And uh, now, do you, you offer a full range of... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my main offer is, as you'll see, if you go onto my website, um, which is just mjrsolicitors.com, um, I offer sort of your wills, um, estate planning, um, inheritance tax advice, um, powers of attorney, um, and also I deal with some motoring offences as well. Um, but you'll see if you go on the, the main sort of what you can see on the first few pages is all about wills and estate administration. There's quite a lot of information on there. Um, 
which isn't always the most fun to read. It can be quite dry, I think, as we were discussing before we started. Um, but hopefully I've sort of compacted it down to sort of more relevant topics that you can quickly see, quickly view, and quickly see the format and the bullet points, um, and then go from there. And as I said, it, it goes right through all the different options you have, and it, and for a free consultation, all, all of those as well. So not just um, a state administration. You, see, you can go and speak to Mark absolutely free of charge for the first, uh, for the consultation, the initial consultation. That in itself is going to be a bonus. Um, and then you can be guided from there. And if people want to contact you, how do they do that, Mark? Um, they contact me via email. Um, by obviously just uh, mark at mjrsolicitors.com. Um, contact me via phone, uh, got home phone number, or the office phone number, sorry, should I say, the 01243 uh, 945054. And um, there's also a mobile, which I use as well, obviously being out and about fairly regular, um, the 07881 Um Happy to be contacted by any of those methods. Um, and then from there, again, arrange a time for either a consultation or just have a chat over the phone as well, just give a bit of uh, guidance, maybe a bit of assistance. Um, and then take it from there, really. Okay, well, that's brilliant. So all of you people out there that haven't made your wheels out, you need to go and see him for a start, because then he can sort your stuff out when you do fall off the perch, as it were. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry about that use of that, uh, that phrase, but it's one I do use regularly. Um, well, thanks for coming in and talking to us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's been great. Giving us uh, you know, some idea of what the non-stuffy solicitor is about. <laughs> people don't have to wear, <clears throat> excuse me, people don't have to wear a colour and tie to come and see you. And the fact that they're not wearing a colour and tie won't be added to the bill. No, definitely not. I try not to try to wear a tie the least amount of time as possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Thanks much again, Mark. Thanks very much. Cheers now. Thank you, gentlemen. And now we've reached the end of this week's show. So it's thanks to all our contributors, including Local Life magazine, our sound editor, John Mallett, our presenters, Alison and Keith. Not forgetting, of course, our producer, John Fletcher. So it's goodbye from me, Tony Weiner. Until next time. Bye.